Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. Um, this week I'm going to be speaking about Bhutan. It was a really interesting learning about it. As always, I'm going to start with ways in which I related to the country and the culture. Number two will be um, history. Part three will be the book review and I will finish with some fun facts. So let's get started. Um, ways in which I related. I have five. So number one would be that the food is really spicy. Um, here are some dishes uh, and that was very similar to Mexican cuisine which is also really spicy. Number two is the idea of like living in a family um, or like eating together. It's also really common in uh, rural areas of Bhutan for uh, families to sleep all in one living room area. Um, so it just reminded me of like being together with your family and that's something that's really important in Mexican families or in my family anyway. Um, number three is uh, living in communion with your neighbors and with your town folk. Uh, it reminded me of my hometown where uh, you say hello to you know people passing by and you know your neighbors and then your neighbors help you in things. Um, so I just thought that was nice. And number four would be the idea of karma while for them uh, you know they have positive and negative karma and if you're good they believe that that um, will help you in your life and in your reincarnation um, from their buddhist teachings uh, that reminded me and and conversely if you are bad you know that will affect you in this life and in your reincarnation um, and then that just reminded me of just the general idea that i think lots of religious um, countries or people have of being good um, for the sake of being good and uh, number five would be that you can't enter into a home where a woman has just had birth so you can't see like the mom or the baby for four days until they do a purification ritual so that kind of reminded me of in Hispanic families we uh, give babies like a red bracelet to ward off like the evil eye or any like harmful spirits um, or harmful energies towards our newborns. Um, okay, so let's go on to the history. So I wanted to start this time with an overview. So the capital is Timbu. Um, the population is approximately 800,000 people and the main language is Jonka. Um, so for the history, something that was super interesting about Bhutan is that it is one of the few countries that has never been colonized. So that was refreshing to read. Um, so let's get started around um, 747 after Christ um, come some Tibetan migrants um, that are led by Songsteng Gampo. In the 13th century uh, comes a spiritual Buddhist master called Pajo Drugom Zingpo. Uh, he is from Tibet and he con uh, commences the teachings of Drukpa, which is a Buddhist um, sect. In the 17th century, Bhutan is unified under the leadership of Gawang Namyal, um, who establishes the school of Drukpa, which as I just talked is um, is a part of a sect in Buddhism. So this sect um, has an emphasis on meditation and the preservation of um, the environment. Uh, and Drukpa, some like a fun fact is that Drukpa tra translates to dragon, uh, which symbolizes power and um, strength in Bhutan. And that's on their flag as well. In 1865, um, the Treaty of Sinchula between Bhutan and in like British India is uh, signed, is establishing peace and defining some uh, borders for both territories. In 1907, Ugyen Wangchuk is elected as the first hereditary king of Bhutan and he establishes the Wangchuk dynasty, which still governs Bhutan today. In 1949, Bhutan signs the, um, the Friendship Treaty with India, which allows India a vote in the relations, uh, in the external relationships with Bhutan, but it allows Bhutan to maintain its independence. Um, in 1958, there are some policies that are established um, that allow for uh, Hindu temples to be placed in, um, alongside Buddhist temples in the south of the country and that's important because a lot of Nepalese um, 
ethnic Nepalese uh, people come to Bhutan, come to the south of Bhutan um, back in like 1620. So it's important because a lot of them are practicing Hinduism that their, you know, their religion be represented as well or re and respected. In 1971, Bhutan um, becomes a member of the United Nations. In 1974, the first um, tourist or, uh, yeah, the first tourists are welcomed to the country. So it was completely um, devoid of tourism or external, yeah, external influence basically before then. In, in 1988, um, under a new reform, this minority in the South, the Lotsampas are reclassified and later their citizenship is taken away. Um, they are expelled basically out of um, Bhutan and since that, since then, the 1980s um, up until, you know, recently, more than a hundred thousand of them have been expelled, forcibly expelled out of Bhutan. In 1989, um, so a year after this starts, um, the school the hindu schools are all closed um one of the something that's important to know is that there's there were a lot of tensions between um the buddhist bhutanese group and um this ethnic nepalese but now you know obviously now bhutanese because they've been there for so many years and that was their home to them who practice hinduism and um one of the things that was a clash was that like wearing Bhutanese or Jongsa like uh, clothing was compulsory for everyone. Obviously, those people who are not um, Buddhist and Jongsa do not want to, um, you know, have like wear those clothing, don't want to have to practice a different religion. So um, there's obviously a lot of clashing and tension between those groups and which led to this expulsion. And in 18, in, sorry, in 1991, um, the government starts to make people f sign these um, voluntary um, migration forms, which resulted in, again, more expulsion, like I said. And also, it's just like also important to note that the Luxapas made up about a, a sixth of the population. So they were the minority, but they were still a very large part of the country. In 2005, after a lot of struggles and, um, you know, um, a lot of protest on, on behalf of um, the, the refugees, um, United States, Australia, the United Kingdom, among other countries, um, opened their borders to these refugees and took some in. Um, some of these refugees did not want to move um, as they felt that, you know, leaving to another country would just allow them to no longer have the possibility to return to their, um, to their own country, right, Bhutan. So in 2008, um, Bhutan uh, made the transition from a monarchy, a constitutional monarchy, to have like more, um, more of a democracy and they uh, had their first parliament elections. Uh, today, the Prime Minister is Lotai Shering, and the King is still uh, Jigmi Keshar Namyel Wangchuk, which I, I noted was still from way back when. Um, and that's all. Now, onto the book. I really, really loved it. I thought it was such a beautiful illustration, a narration of what life is like for, you know, um, a, an ordinary person in Bhutan. Uh, the story follows uh, Somo, which is a fifth, who is a, who is a fifteen year old girl um, from a rural farming town in uh, Bhutan, um, and she, you know, she has to she has to go through a lot of hardships in her life, and it talks about how she grows as a person, as a woman, as someone finding her own way, even in um, you know as a sister like in a society where women are more, um, you know, I feel like this, this is worldwide, but in the society where women are, um, more repressed than men, I think, um, it's such a great book to read, especially this month, um, that celebrates, you know, women. Um, and I would really, really recommend it again. Like I said, the book is about a girl who she's 15 
This happens around the 1940s and 50s. And um, she also travels through various um, countries. So I thought that was just a really awesome trajectory of her life. I'd really, really recommend it. So on to the fun facts. I have eight of them because I just thought it was really interesting. So number one is that Bhutan actually has a gross happiness, uh, gross national happiness index, which uh, was established by the king in the 1970s to give priority to the welfare of its people. Um, like we learned from the history, not, none of them, uh, no government is perfect, um, but this um, did allow for free education and free healthcare, conservation of uh, culture and um, conservation of, uh, of the environment. So that's been cool. Number two is that it is the only carbon negative uh, country in the world, which means that they absorb more CO2 than, than the CO2 that they produce, helping um, the environment and the planet. 72% um, of the country is actually forest, and this will continue to be in place as it is a requirement from the government to maintain for 60% of, of the country's land to be covered in trees. Number three, there is a legend, um, that an interesting legend about their national animal. It is believed that in the 15th century, a uh, Sipetan saint um, put the, the head of a goat on the body of a cow, and hence the um, national animal was created, the Takin. And number four, uh, the national sport is archery. Number five, tourism, like I said, didn't start until the 19, till 1974. And today, uh, you have to pay $200 a day um, as a, like a tax just to visit. But I think that's actually pretty good because people, a lot of people, a lot of the tourism um, is not great for the environment. So um, I'm glad that there are some measures in place. Number six, uh, it was the last country to introduce the television until 1998. Uh, number seven, it was mandatory that uh, they use their uh, traditional garment, which is why you see a lot of the people um, preserving their culture and preserving their textile, um, the textile aspect of their culture. Number eight is that there are no um, there are no traffic lights. There are just, um, in the big cities, there are just policemen diverting people on the road. So yeah, <laughs> thank you for watching. I will see you guys for my next update on Saturday. If you would like to see what country I get next, don't forget to follow my Instagram. Thanks.